Hi, welcome to the Herbal Hour. I'm Stephen Horn. With me today is Kimberly Ballas, Dr. Hi. Kimberly Ballas, naturopathic physician, and we are going to talk about parasites. Um, who's eating your lunch? How to stop parasites from damaging your health. This is a really interesting subject and kind of a little bit scary in some ways. Kim, what actually are parasites doing to people? Well, there are a lot of underlying reasons that health-wise how parasites can affect your health. Um, a lot of people just don't feel well, so mm -hmm. they have no idea why, and you've tried everything, and you've changed your diet, you've changed your program. Um, how many prescriptions are people on? Um, I just heard a comment from one medical professional, and it was, uh, you should actually have one prescription for every 10 years of life. So... <laughs> I'm about okay. four behind. Okay. Uh, me, I'm five behind. Okay. <laughs> How do you deal with um, chronic fatigue? How many people do you know have chronic fatigue and they can't figure out why? They can't figure out what's going on. How many people do you know that have been diagnosed with cancer? That number keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. So there has to be some underlying root problem. We keep um, working on symptoms. The medical profession has become a disease care profession instead of a health profession. Um, we have disease care models pathologically. Also, we appear to be living longer, but why aren't we healthier? Why do we have all the attributes of living in a non-third world country with all of the resources at our fingertips, yet we're one of the unhealthiest countries on the planet? So in other words, with all of the tools of modern medicine, how come so many people are still sick? And although we appear to be living longer, how, many, how come when people get older, they're just in such rotten shape? I mean, those are good questions. Well, we have to look at quality of life. So we have root causes to the quality of life. We have root causes to disease, and we talk about that a lot in some of the other With courses our, our and videos. With our disease tree model up here, we've talked about that a lot. So as we're talking about parasites, I think one of the important things here is that um, parasites aren't necessarily the root cause. It's the the nutritional deficiencies, the toxicity, and so forth create the biological terrain or the environment for the parasites. But once the parasites are in place, then they contribute to a downward spiral of deteriorating health. Once the biological terrain is out of balance, which is blood, urine, lymph, and saliva, which maintains a, a healthy state for the cells, once that's out of balance, then the parasites have a buffet, so to speak, that they have a feeding ground. So it's a really nice place for them to live. Yeah, in fact, um, parasites are probably the most common undiagnosed health challenge that we face in modern society. And we tend to think of parasites as something people pick up in third world countries. But the truth of the matter is parasites are not just a third world problem. They're in every country in the world. And if we count single-celled organisms, it's probable that 95% of all Americans have one form of parasite living them. Of course, we're including in here things like yeast and giardia and, and amoebas and those kind of organisms. Right. Um, so, Kim, what is a parasite? A parasite is an organism that lives off from its host. That could apply to house guests, too. Right? Yes, I suppose it could. <laughs> I've met a few people who would qualify for that. <laughs> they, they steal our energy. They steal our nutrients. Um, they block our nutrient uptake, they drain the life of the host organism because they're robbing our vital energy. Well, I mean, we have some organisms that live in a symbiotic relationship with us, like the, the probiotics. The probiotics, the in, good bacteria. In other words, th it's a mutually beneficial relationship. But in this case, the, or the parasites, it's not a mutually beneficial relationship because they're basically making us sicker and weaker. So what do parasites do? Well, parasites can cause breakdown, deterioration of the organs because they block or they steal the nutrients that the organs need to rebuild. So the cells aren't getting the tools that they need in order to replicate healthy. So that actually affects our RNA, our DNA, because of the nutrients that were robbed. They, um, the microscopic parasites actually can invade the joints and that can lead to arthritis. That can be an underlying root cause of arthritis. Um, they also can eat away the myelin sheath and that's like that little thin covering that's on the the nerve they can eat away the myelin sheath and then that 
affects how the nerve signals get to and from the brain. So you're getting impaired muscle movement, um, you're not getting feedback loops, you're not getting signals, neurotransmitter activity, you're, and it actually affects the hormones in a major way because of those brain signals going on. Um, they also can cause blood sugar problems because the parasites feed off the blood sugar. So then you're robbed of the energy production that you need in the TCA cycle in the cell. So you're not getting energy production and then the long run of that is if you're not getting the energy production, you're not flushing the toxins out of the body either. I also understand that things like yeast, because they feed off of sugar, release chemicals that kind of hijack the body and make us crave sugar. It's like so, a methylation process. It's like a fermentation. So, And then when that fermentation goes on, then the parasites live off from that because that is an offset of a sugar derivative. So then they have more to live off from. Okay. And these things also reproduce, right? So they can live in the body for 10, 20, even 30 years, and they'll come from contaminated food and water. And the small parasites can function like bacteria and move into the bloodstream and go into different parts of the body. And um, the, the microscopic ones also reproduce without laying eggs. But the larger parasites lay eggs which get into the intestines, right? And then what about this thing with the parasites' sec secretions? Well, parasites secrete lubricants, okay? So they have um, waste materials or things that they surround themselves to protect um, the, these protective liquids, and that keeps them alive because it wards off viruses that would attack them, um, bacteria, these um, other harmful organisms that might penetrate through their their sheath or their protective coating and that helps them also this coating they put out helps them attract food so it creates like a magnetic resonancy so to speak that it draws the nutrients that they need to them and then all of these toxins that the host that has um, to, has to be broken down and eliminated puts more stress on the body because not only do we have the toxins coming in from residual stuff that we're doing or environmental toxins or from our nutrients from breakdown of inorganic to organic substances, then we have also the toxins that the parasites have broken down and even their fecal matter. And well, isn't, this, isn't it true that really like a lot of infections, like even bacterial infections, the real problem isn't the microorganisms, it's the toxins that they release it's into the, the body? It's the elimination, yeah. It's the toxins yeah. they excrete and it's the elimination. So a lot of times that's the same with viral components too. It's the offset. It's kind of like a when you have a new house and you have outgassing, it's kind of like the outgassing of the parasite that's more of a problem sometimes than the actual parasite. Well, some people, you know, are taking a lot of supplements and they just don't seem to get well at all. So could parasites be a problem here? Well, the parasites feed off the supplements. So, oh, so, um, so they're just, uh, they're not really getting the benefit from the supplements because the parasites are getting the nutrients. Yeah, so if you take a really high quality supplement, then your parasites are very happy. Oh, they good. get a higher quality. Well, how do we pick up parasites? There are a lot of ways to pick up parasites. You can do the contaminated food and water. Um, if you own pets, um, you know, you're cleaning a pet's litter box if you have a cat, things like that, the cage. Um, even through the pores of our skin, just out walking around, there are some airborne parasites, so through inhalation. Um, you will get sometimes the, the eggs or the larvae um, can be laid under the skin with insect bites and also with, with kissing or intercourse. So any type of fluid exchange with, with another human can pass them along. Okay, so obviously, you know, one of the things I think about when I do this kind of things is it seems like, you know, this is, can be really, really scary <laughs> when you think about all the different organisms that are possible, you know, but for, for the most part, if your terrain is healthy, that is if your, your, your system is generally healthy, you're not going to have the environment for the parasites to take root. I mean, because we're, it's like infection, we're exposed to this stuff all the time, but it's when our body gets weakened and the environment's there that the parasites are then going to attach themselves and really start to multiply out of control. Well, um, if you're not a good host, people leave. <laughs> so it, it's your one chance to be rude. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is these are these are particular things we want to be rude to. We don't want to be good hosts for parasites. Now, why is it why is it that medical doctors aren't you know dealing more with parasites? Well, a lot of the medical tests, you know, you're doing a stool sample, okay, uh -huh. to check for parasites most of the time, and when you're doing the stool samples. Um, 
or other tissue um, things that you would do to check for like parasites, blood or, blood or urine or saliva, it has to be an offset of that parasite. So you have to have a die off of that parasite or because you're not checking for parasite excretions, you're checking for the actual parasite. So you have like um, the parasite has to be in that particular stool movement that you're testing or it has to have, you know, in that um, particular, particular, blood sample. particular blood sample. Um, so there aren't a lot of ways to, to really effectively check to test test for parasitical activity. So you just assume um, with 95% of all of us having them that you have parasitical activity and you just go from there and do you know regular maintenance. So, so cleansing. The, uh, the medical tests will sometimes come back negatively even if you have parasites? Medical tests usually only 15 to 20 percent of the time come back positive and that's a high that's a high percentage so wow. um, usually they come back negative that there's no parasites present even though they are and it's like they, they identify and diagnose this only 20% of the time. And then it's like only a small range of parasites um, because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different kinds of parasites. And there's only a small range of what the tests are actually set up to identify. Yeah, so the tests are only available for 40 to 50 types of parasites, and, uh, which is only about 5% of about the actual 5%. known yeah. parasites. And there's over a thousand species of parasites that live in the human body and prescription drugs often just drive the parasite from one part of the body to another part of the body. Exactly. Yeah. Plus the prescription drugs are often contributing to toxicity in the system which is further imbalancing the terrain which is the underlying problem in well, the first place. Creates another good host condition when you have the residual runoff of, of the prescription. So why don't we recognize the parasites are there? Well, we didn't send them an invitation, and they didn't knock on the door, so we don't know who came. <laughs> we just have to assume they exist. So they're, they're living without being detected, and they, they're, they, they, they're intelligent enough to figure out how to sneak past our defenses and survive and reproduce. So, so let's, let's look at some of the ways we can recognize that we might have parasites, and some of them that are really common symptoms that would alert you to the possibility of needing to work do a parasite cleanse include itchy ears, nose, or anus, um, an increase in appetite but still feeling hungry when you're eating, um, teeth grinding, uh, digestive pain, nausea, or diarrhea, um, health problems that occur after you've been traveling, and just general weakness, weakness or lethargy that just doesn't seem to go away. Those are all really good indications that we might have parasites. If you're just if you're working with someone and you kind of hit a health plateau with them that okay you've tried this program you you know pretty well you're pretty well convinced what the underlying root cause is and you just can't seem to get past this plateau with somebody then I would probably look at doing some type of parasitical cleanse. Yeah. Now some of the other symptoms you might have which are a little um, less common but they could include yellowish face, a rapid heartbeat, heart pain, uh, sexual dysfunction, forgetfulness, slow reflexes, gas and bloating, unclear thinking, um, loss of appetite, and continuing on, blurry vision, pain in the back, um, thighs or shoulders, numb hands, burning in the stomach, menstrual irregularity, drooling while sleeping, dry lips during the day, and bedwetting in children. So those are, you know, some pretty common symptoms that would indicate a possibility of a need to try a, a parasite cleanse. So that just pertains to about everybody you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, tell us how parasites damage our health. Well, well, just like we talked about before, part of the biggest problem are the toxins from the parasites. So it's that um, excretion or the waste products that we have to deal with with the parasites. So those can clog the colon. So it can affect your elimination mechanisms. And then if it's clogging the colon, then you're getting auto intoxication because then you just start recycling what's there because you're not eliminating. Then it goes up to the liver and it the liver to has the, to detoxify that. Then the, yeah, the excess has to go to the liver. So um, also with the liver, with the different channels of elimination in the liver, that's going to affect the blood and it's gonna eventually affect the lymphatic system. And then you have congestion in the interstitial tissue and then that's blocking nutrient absorption and that's blocking the toxins being excreted. So it becomes this big loop or this big cycle that, okay, now the bowel can't eliminate, then you got auto intoxication, then the liver can't get it taken care of, so then it goes to the blood, then the blood can't handle it, so then it's in the interstitial and just keeps going in this cycle. So you get, you get the toxins spilling into the bloodstream, then the kidneys and liver and other eliminated organs can't handle them. And meanwhile, those eliminated organs need nutrients to in order to detoxify and the parasites are also 
picking up nutrients. Right, and then and then part of it is the lungs. The lungs being part of the eliminatory pathway too. And you you think of that. Well, how do the parasites affect that? Well, yeah, you can have parasites microscopically in the lungs, but it affects it because of how the blood streams moving or not moving, like not eliminating how it's stuck in the interstitial. How that affects the baroreceptors. Um, it's just again just this chain reaction of what's being affected and how it can move out of the body. So our eliminatory organs like keeping the colon and the kidney and the lung and the lymph moving are the keys, um, especially while doing cleanses, to get this out of the system. Okay. So obviously we want to avoid parasites. So some of the things we should do is um, keep the intestinal tract healthy because that's going to keep the terrain so it isn't friendly to the microorganisms. Eat a healthy diet. Um, wash hands after handling pets or preparing raw meat. And it's a really good idea for everyone to do a periodic um, col uh, parasite cleanse because you know it's just something that's kind of a preventive thing to, to take some antiparasitic herbs on a regular basis. Um, some good indications that you might want to do a parasite cleanse and, and stop these parasites from robbing your health is if you can't get results with your herbal program, then try a parasite cleanse. If you've got symptoms that just don't seem to go away no matter what you do, do a parasite cleanse. If you have any kind of chronic degenerative illness, then do a parasite cleanse. In other words, just, this, it's just a good thing to try as, uh, as, as a basic health improvement. Let's talk a little bit about some of the herbs that we can use to help get rid of the parasites. So we're gonna look at our herbal materia medica for parasites. And there are a number of terms that cover um, remedies that are used um, for parasites. And these terms include the term antiparasitic, uh, vermifuge, parasiticide, and antihelmetics. And I was interesting, I learned helm is a Greek word for worm, and so helmetic is a general term for worm parasite. So that term, I, I was always wondering what that term <laughs> meant. Uh, well, first of all, one of the things that's not an herbal supplement that's really good for parasites is enzymes um, because the parasites have a shell that protects them and digestive enzymes actually help to prevent you from getting um, parasitical infections and help to actually break them down and expel them um, because they kind of digest the parasite uh, and digest the shell so the parasite can be killed. And the way to use enzymes to get rid of parasites is to take the enzymes on an empty stomach between meals so that the enzymes are going into the digestive tract and not breaking down food. And one of the one of the important ones I use too is protease there because it breaks down protein and parasites uh -huh. are made up of protein. And if you do live cell analysis and you can see that little proteolytic action going on within the, the cell and it looks like a just little proteins and stuff trying to get into the cell. It helps to break that down, but you have to do it on the empty stomach. Yeah. Well, two of the herbs that have been used to expel parasites are rich in enzymes, so their basic action is enzymatic, and the first one is papaya. And papaya is a fruit that contains antiseptic and antiparasitic compounds, including one called carpenine. And papaya contains enzymes that are proteolytic enzymes that help to destroy parasites. And while the fruit is helpful, it's actually the seeds that are the more potent part. So eating a few papaya seeds, which they often do in tropical countries to prevent parasites. Well, I find it really interesting too because eating papaya seeds helps to lower high blood pressure in some people. So I would look at that, that their high blood pressure may be there because of a parasitical issue. That's a very interesting idea. And another one is pineapple. Pineapple, um, a, a diet consisting of nothing but raw pineapple um, for several days has been used to expel tapeworms because the pineapple contains a protein digesting enzyme called bromelain. So there we're back to the idea of the high potency protease the, um, being very beneficial for helping get rid of these worms. Now there's a particular class of herbs, a group of herbs in the genus called Artemisia. And um, this genus contains um, typically bitter and aromatic herbs. It's, it's part of the sunflower family, family, and they contain sesquiterpene lactones that have very strong antiparasitic effects. So we've got some examples here of some of the Artemisias that have been used as antiparasitics in various parts of the world. One of them is wormwood. Another one is mugwort. Um, Sweet Annie, which is used against malaria in China. 
sagebrush, which is out here in the west, Artemisia tridentata, southern wood in the south, and tarragon, which is a, a spice. And all of these are in the genus Artemisia, and all of them have um, some antiparasitic activity. We're going to talk a little more detail about two of them. One of them is mugwort, and you have a picture here of the mugwort. It's an antiparasitic herb that's also digestive stimulating. It stimulates the digestive secretions and tones up the digestive tract. And it's one of the milder artemisias. It's also used to stimulate labor and to prevent miscarriage in Japan, uh, in China. But um, and it's also one of the things that's used in moxibustion, where they burn things and put little cups on people. And it's considered to be a very good remedy for um, malaria, but it's also useful for a number of other parasites. I also use the mugwort in an essential oil because if you're going to go out, you're going to be at the lake, you're going to be doing outdoor activities that you may not have shoes on, just put a little um, strip of the mugwort essential oil down the foot and oh, that, yeah. that can help repel. And that would help keep you from picking up parasites through the bottoms of your feet. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, the, one of the strongest antiparasitics is wormwood. Um, and wormwood uh, is symbolic of bitterness. The Latin name uh, means without sweetness. Um, and it's a strong antiparasitic and digestive stimulant. It's, it's strong enough to be a natural insecticide and insect repellent. But this one is contraindicated in pregnancy, so pregnant women should not take Artemisia. And the essential oil of wormwood is so strong that it is actually hallucinogenic and toxic in large quantities. So this is an herb you take in small quantities for a limited period of time in order to get rid of, of parasites. Now, Kim, um, you're, a, you're into aromatherapy a lot, and I know aromatics can have a strong antiparasitic effect too, can't they? There are several. We mentioned the, the mugwort that I use is called white mugwort, and you can use that one. There are some of the citrus oils too that you can use, like your um, bergamot. That's another one. Um, there's some cinnamon, clove. All of those have an action that's going to help repel parasites. Um, what I use with the clove and the nutmeg and the ginger as a, a combination, if you put that on the abdominal area, and it helps when you're doing parasite cleanses because it helps them to release um, and almost like puts them in a coma because those particular oils are called, they're in a narcotics category. So it helps them to release so that you're not like just pulling them out and, and um, affecting the mucus this membrane lining of ripping or tearing. Yeah, because some of these parasites like cling latch to the, on. latch on to the lining of the intestine. So, so this actually kind of like knocks them out, so they right. Let so go. That, so it, it gives an easier release, so you don't have as much of the spasming and the cramping um, intestinally when you're doing a parasite cleanse. So I, I use them more that way, but using them as a preventative, um, like the thyme, and also um, the thyme is a very um, strong antiparasitic, the uh, linalol, and you can just use that again topically if you're going out um, or just on a daily basis, um, just um, somewhere like within a massage oil applying mm -hmm. it. Well you mentioned cloves and that's a common co cooking spice and that it contains um, eugenol which is a powerful antiseptic phenol that also has antiparasitic activity. And cloves are actually used in Southeast Asia a lot of the way that we tend to use cayenne pepper in Western herbalism. It's kind of a panacea for everything. It's used for malaria, cholera, tuberculosis, scabies, and other infections. And um, the use of cloves was um, really popularized for parasites with um, Hulda Clark's um, cure for all cancers, where it's one of the main ingredients she uses is capsules of fresh ground cloves. So cloves is one of the herbs that's a very potent antiparasitic herb when taken internally. Another one so of the, yeah. It's kind of interesting that like um, one of your higher parasitical meats is pork and there's the tradition of putting the cloves in the ham, so you wonder where that came from. If so it has yeah, a, it has yeah. a purpose. Yeah, and actually, um, in lamb, a lot of times you 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 I've cooked uh, lamb, cut little slits, and stuck garlic cloves down mm -hmm. in too. So garlic is another antiparasitic. So cooking foods with garlic also helps to get rid of the the parasites. Raw garlic is a potent antiparasitic agent and works on intestinal fungal and bacterial infections, and it's particularly useful for getting rid of worms, including pinworms, roundworms, hookworms, tapeworms, and it's also useful for giardia and yeast. And you mentioned thyme a little earlier. Um, can you tell us a little bit about thyme? Thyme works a lot with fungal infections, so it helps to remove the fungal infections. Um, it works with um, skin parasites and also abdominal um, parasitical activity. So you would just use it topically on the abdominal area. 
um, like we said, in a massage oil to rub on like we were talking about. Um, it's, it's probably one of the better ones to use for children because it's a little bit milder with the thyme linalol. So Rather they can than tolerate the strong that. stuff like wormwood. Yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't use the wormwood or even the, the mugwort a lot on children, but you could use the thyme very effectively. Right. Um, now, a couple of other herbs, these aren't aromatics, these are a different class. One of them is L-campane. Uh, L-campane contains two anti-amoebic compounds, which I won't attempt to pronounce, <laughs> and they also help eliminate intestinal worms. It contains inulin, which is a um, fructooligosaccharide, which um, actually helps feed friendly intestinal bacteria, which helps protect the colon, and it's a very, very safe remedy. It's one that you could use with children. And as well, there's an essential oil. The um, inula is another essential oil made from the Ella campaign that you can use as topical application as well. Oh, great. And uh, of course, one of the ones that a lot of people are familiar with is black walnut. Um, black walnut is uh, the hole around the nut um, is used. It's a traditional antiparasitic remedy. And particularly, most herbalists actually recommend using the green hulls, although we found that the, black, uh, the, the dried hulls, the black stuff, works too. It's high in iodine, which helps to kill parasites. And I know when we had our, did our iodine uh, video, you mentioned that you know parasites and microbes can't live in an iodine-rich environment, right. which is part of, probably part of the reason that this one works so well. It's also an anti-diarrheal remedy. So when you've got parasites that are causing diarrhea, it helps to stop the diarrhea. And it also helps burn up toxins and fatty material, which gets rid of the host strain. And it's interesting on the black walnut, on one of the studies that I did with um, a group of fibromyalgia, we were actually using the black walnut as a, more of like a placebo um, and in the opposition to the other remedies that we were using for the other group and it actually turned out that the people that did the black walnut got a higher benefit. <laughs> so it had to do, like again, we're talking about that underlying chronic fatigue with that parasitical activity that could be a potential cause for it. So the black walnut actually would work well in your chronic fatigue situations with underlying parasitical issues. Well, One of the little things I learned from Matthew Wood, which is a favorite thing about doctrine of signatures with black walnut, is walnut trees secrete a toxin from their roots that prevents other plants from growing underneath them, including grass. And so the, the, that spongy outside that we use in herbal medicine that's sitting around the nut is actually so when the nut falls from the tree, it'll bounce and roll away from the parent tree because if it, if it tries to grow too close to the parent tree, the parent tree will kill it. So walnut is used for helping get rid of, of uh, parasitical influences and helping um, people who had this is the flower remedy, who had domineering parents who won't let them grow, so it sounds pretty parasitic to me. Um, golden seal is also a useful um, remedy for giardia, which is one of the um, single-celled parasites. It reduces low-grade chronic inflammation in the intestinal tract, stimulates appetite and digestive secretions, and it's actually in the Materia Medica of quite a few countries around the world as a remedy for giardia, which is a very common um, intestinal tract parasite. Another um, very common remedy that's very mild and very safe is pumpkin seeds. Um, Native Americans chewed on pumpkin seeds to get rid of worms. Um, what they found is that pumpkin seeds immobilize the worms, uh, paralyze them, so that they'll can let go and helps to um, uh, work with other remedies to get, get them um, get rid of the parasites. But for best results, you want to eat about an ounce of pumpkin seeds a day. And I find that when I have um, patients and I'm asking them like what they snack on and um, I have a few and they tell me, well, you know, I just, it seems like I can't get enough. I just constantly am eating pumpkin seeds. Then I know that we probably need to do a parasite cleanse. <laughs> Very good. And you're familiar with this next one, so why don't you tell us about grapefruit seed? Well, the grapefruit seed extract, um, it's a germicidal. So it's its non-toxic, but it's um, its a little challenging to take sometimes. It's a little bitter. <laughs> but, I've tried it. It is nasty. <laughs> and, but it, it's a really good alternative to um, an antibiotic because it works very similar in, in changing the terrain so that the bacteria can exist in its environment. So it shifts the cellular terrain. It also helps um, resisting bacteria and viruses and fungal and parasitical activity. So it actually builds up the immune system um, to deal with what, what the invading parasite or bacteria is that's coming in. Right. And turmeric, which is another um, herb from Ayurvedic, is used in India 
by folk healers um, to get rid of worms, particularly ne nematodes, which is a worm we're going to talk about in a minute. It contains four compounds that have antiparasitic activity, and it's also anti-inflammatory and hepatoprotective or liver protecting. And our last remedy in our Materia Medica here is the pawpaw. And um, pawpaw has been used to help um, with cancer, but pawpaw also inhibits ATP production inside cells, and so it's used to help inhibit and kill parasites by inhibiting their production of energy, which also inhibits their reproduction, and it's a safe remedy to use on pets. Have you used it with, you know, I've used parasites a lot with, um, I mean, I've used pawpaw a lot with parasites. <laughs> and um, also it works really well on lice um, if you're doing the remedy on the head, so as a parasite there. Yeah, and head lice. The head lice. You and, mix um, it with the shampoo and then... Just mix it in with your shampoo, yeah, and uh -huh. let it sit. The key is letting it sit for a while. But it does go into the cell and it slows down the ATP ATP production in the um, TCA cycle. So you are going to be a little tired when you're doing the pawpaw and everybody thinks, well, I, you know, I want the energy, I want the energy because we're such adrenaline junkies, but you are going to be a little bit tired when you're doing a pawpaw and a parasite cleanse too because you're redirecting energy in the body to go in and deal with these invading organisms. So you're not going to have the energy that you usually have. Okay. Well, now that we've kind of covered some of our anti-parasitic um, herbs and remedies, we want to uh, meet the tenants. Uh, we're going to look at the different kinds of parasites, and this is the part that I guess gets a little bit gross, although I did take out some of the more gross pictures that you <laughs> submitted to me, really Kim. Good pictures in there. <laughs> she had some pictures of worms in a heart, and worms on the brain, and worms in someone's leg, and it's like, yeah, gross. <laughs> but we're going to talk about it. So Kim, why don't you tell us a little about some of our our unwanted tenants that <laughs> now take, I have up, to be verbally graphic. Take, take up residence. <laughs> well, the verbal graphic is bad enough. The pictures were actually down. The first one we're going to look at um, is tapeworms, okay? Um, the beef tapeworm, and then there's a pork tapeworm. And sometimes these can reach 10 feet. Um, or there have been some that I've seen measurements on 30 feet if they can remove them in a complete segment. What happens is usually there are three to 4,000 segments in one worm, so it breaks off, and they don't die when they have a segment that breaks off. So they just keep regenerating, and they just keep growing and going and going. So you never really fully get them until you get the actual little part that has the little suction cups on it to release so they actually live in the digestive tract and they absorb the nutrients through the skin um, they feed off from um, the nutrients and supplements coming in and again doing a parasite cleanse sometimes you you may or may not see excretion of the actual components of the parasite because some of them are microscopic. The tapeworm is not as microscopic, but it comes off in small segments. Well, there was an interesting th thing that each, of, each segment in the tapeworm has its own reproductive organs. So new segments get formed at the head, okay? And, they, and then at the end, as they mature, they actually are cast off and carry eggs to reproduce more tapeworms. So when you pass them, they look like little grains of uncooked rice or cucumber seeds. So that's one way of identifying that you might have a problem is if you see some of those in the stool of yourself or a pet or something like that. And the infections in animals are usually diagnosed by finding those little things in the stools. Um, tapeworms require an intermediate host. The, yeah, some of the intermediate hosts are your fleas, fish, um, domestic animals like um, sheep, pigs, cats, dogs, horses. Um, the tapeworm doesn't really have any digestive organs itself, but they absorb nutrients through their skin. So it's like a osmality that they take it in, just much like a fish with the gills and how they um, so they're use just the gills. soaking up the nutrients in your digestive tract with their little <laughs> wormy things in there. Okay. So, look at what are some of the symptoms? Some of the symptoms. Um, well, you you can have alternating between the diarrhea and the constipation. So, the spastic colon can be a symptom. Um, people that have chronic diarrhea also I look at as a symptom for tapeworms. Um, people that lose weight, but um, usually you're going to have people that uh, gain weight easily and can't figure out why. And you've looked at all the root causes. Um, cortisol levels are okay, things like that, but they're still gaining. And they tend to have water retention. That can be an underlying tapeworm symptom. 
Um, anemia is another one. Um, so you're going to look at your iron levels, your hemoglobin, your hemocrit levels, and that's going to give you a good indicator too. If those remain low, um, despite taking the B12 and doing an iron supplement, then I would look at a parasitical issue there too. Um, so, and some of your genetic factor five, factor 12 things can actually be from you know, um, in a history of parasitical activity. So, um, also your blood sugars may elevate, so your insulin levels are going to go up. So regulating glucose may be an issue for a lot of people that have tapeworms because it's absorbing a lot of what's going on. So the body manufactures more glucose. Um, and this, and it says it appears to be more active at the full moon. So, and that, I always wonder about that because it's like, you know, there's like that Spanish, um, remedy that says you know you should um, to get rid of worms you should sit over whole milk and it has to be on a full moon and but if you look at the cycles and patterns of the earth and you look at magnetic pull you have a larger magnetic pull because you look at the tide activity in the ocean you have a, a greater magnetic pull during a full moon yeah well you know an old time remedy for tapeworms has been to fast for several days and then um, basically sit over a bowl of warm milk and then supposedly the hungry tapeworm will emerge looking for <laughs> That is worse than any picture I had in this video. <laughs> that is... <laughs> well, this subject gets pretty gross, I have to admit. Well, now, why don't you tell us colon a little... therapist. The colon therapist We've got therapist a, got a picture this. in here, a chart that comes from the Center for Disease Control that shows the life cycle of the tapeworm. It's kind of small, but kind yeah, of explain it, a little bit. It starts like within the, in the muscles and how it develops, um, the econosphere develops in the muscles, and then um, how it goes into the hosting animal or so, the intermediate host. So if you host. Eat, eat, eat the meat and it's not cooked properly and it's got the, the parasite in it, then it right. starts growing in your intestines. And and that and that's the intermediate host that we were talking about before. And then it goes into that infectious stage um, and then it starts absorbing nutrients, it implants into the intestinal tract and starts absorbing nutrients so it latches on. And then you start getting, a, well a lot of times it can be, it says an undercooked meat, but it's an undercooked infected meat. So right. we need to clarify that on this. Yeah, well and then, and, then, and then the eggs come out in the stool and then they get, they get into the ground and get picked up by grazing animals which then develop them into their flesh and it just rotates around. Okay, we got some pictures here. Not quite as gross as the ones you had, but we have a tapeworm <laughs> egg and the head of a tapeworm showing its little things where it latches onto your... It latches on. It's like it goes in and it's kind of like a, a locking mechanism because it'll go into the intestinal wall and it doesn't just adhere. It like goes in and then twist like it locks uh -huh. so it's kind of like a lock and key system so that's why it's hard to get the head of the tapeworm out but if you're using those things like we talked about with the narcotic oils the clove the nutmeg the ginger or even like the turmeric using that that's going to help kinda knocks out lets it go well, we've got some other pictures here that are a little more graphic of uh Again, the, tape, the head of the tapeworm and there's a really nice long one can you imagine one of those in your intestinal tract okay um not very fun. <laughs> There's another class of, of tapeworms, um, uh, nematoids. These are, these are a whole bunch of different worms. You got the roundworm or pinworm, the whipworm, hookworm, and uh, another variety of hookworms. So Kim, why don't you tell us about the pinworms first? Well, the pinworms I think are, are pretty common and especially like in animals or in pets you're going to see, um, they're, they're common in school children because they get passed pretty easily um, via like saliva, skin, touching things. So they're highly contagious. Um, they get passed around within the family, um, especially like um, public locations. The eggs get deposited at night and they can um, get into the bed linen and the pajamas and get transported that way. They're also airborne, so they get trans transported through um, uh, sneezes, um, coughs, things like that. Okay. So some symptoms of those um, that you're going to get for the pinworms are going to be um, cause itching in the anal area. Um, the, do the children's rectum with a flashlight at night, the worms appear as white threads at the anal opening. Um, a lot of times, two of the things I found, if kids are grinding their teeth when they're sleeping, that can be a good indication of parasites. Or if you have a toddler or um, 
a, kid, a baby that sleeps um, with its knees pulled up and under it and sleeps like with its bottom in the air. That's another indication of parasitical activity. Okay, um, these can also, the pinworms can be found in the vulva, in the uterus, and in the fallopian tubes too. And of course, we have the CDC thing here of the life cycle of them, which we don't have to go into detail on, but basically this one, you've just got the eggs get out into the environment, they get ingested Justin. and it just cycles around so this one doesn't right. need an intermediate host. It doesn't host. need an intermediate host on this one. So we have some pictures different. here of the um, pinworm eggs and the head of a pinworm. So in a little... Which looks like a pin. Yeah, which looks like a pin. You can see why it's called a pinworm. Okay, the next one is the whipworm. The next one, this one's kind of an interesting because it um, it injects the digestive fluid, um, it converts, which converts the colon tissue into liquid, and then the worms kind of suck that up. So, this that one's, one's pretty serious. It, yeah, well, it is. Um, it uses those excretion things that we talked about uh -huh. um, for its mechanism of survival. So it infects about six billion people in the world and it creates nutritional deficiencies and this one um, actually can create infection. So it can cause a disarray with the whole immune system and we have the life cycle of that one is on here as well. It does not need an intermediate host. So it comes in and then we have some pictures of the whipworm. You can see it looks like a whip. Yes, you can see they why it's named that. They were real creative with these names, yes, weren't they? they were. okay. Yes, obviously. <laughs> the next one is another little scary one, the hookworm. Well, the hookworm, what it does is it tends to bite and suck on the intestinal wall. That can actually cause bleeding going on in, in, within the internal organs, and then that causes breakdown of the tissue. So in order for them to stay alive, they have to consume iron. So this is where anemia is one of the symptoms that you're going to get with this. Your hemoglobin levels go down, your hemocrit levels go down, and you'll also see your white blood cells go up, and you might possibly see platelets go up because it's a reaction to a lot of the oxidative stress going on in the body. It's a reaction to um, where the red blood cells are trying to carry more iron. So you might see um, what's called your red, your RDW, your red cell distribution width, um, might increase. And then you also might see where um, your red blood cells increase as well. So Okay. And we have some uh, pictures of that one. Um, I don't think we have the life cycle one, but we have the hookworm egg and the hookworm head, which has got little teeth in it um, that you know, kind of see the latch into the thing. And we also have another slide showing the actual hookworms. And again, I guess you can see why they call them hookworms. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so creative. Right. Okay. Our next one is Giardia, which is a single-celled organism, and that's actually a very common one. Um, it's actually the most common cause of waterborne disease from either drinking or recreational water in the United States. And Giardia produces a variety of symptoms. A lot of people, you know, it's really funny. I, we, I'm used to being out in the West and camping and some, sometimes I'll see people and they're sitting there like drinking water from a stream and I think, you idiot. You know, it, looks, it looks nice and clean and clear, but if you've got, you know, an animal uh, going to the bathroom upstream, you know, that's got all kinds of parasites and stuff. You got to have a filter. And, and uh, in order to get these things out of water, actually Giardia cysts cannot be removed from water by chlorination because the cysts have a hard shell and, and, and it's, they're not killed. The only way to actually eliminate these from water is by a 0.5 micron filter um, that actually um, pulls them out of the water, um, filters them out of the water and, and, and catches the cysts. When you do get, it takes a lot of them to infect you, but if you're drinking like from, from mountain water or a lake or something like that or water that's been contaminated, You'll get some symptoms of diarrhea, gas and flatulence, um, greasy stools that tend to float, stomach cramps, upset stomach and nausea, and this will usually occur about 7 to 14 days after exposure. Um, we have the life cycle of this one on the screen. Uh, this one uh, gets excreted um, you know, in, in feces, it gets into water, uh, it develops into this cyst form, which can, can survive a lot of different things, and then it can get onto food or water, gets ingested, and again, this one doesn't need an intermediate host. And there's a picture here of a Giardia cyst and a little Giardia organism after it's popped out of its cyst. 
And we have one more of these nasty bugs. <laughs> the fluke. The fluke. <laughs> it's just a fluke. <laughs> a lot of these, um, well, the flukes tend, they come from the sheep liver fluke. Um, these parasites are, um, are herbivores. So they can infect humans. So they're from grass grazing animals. And they're picked up in the area where sheep and cattle are raised. And they're often picked up from freshwater plants like watercress. So here's another thing. If you're not washing off fruits and vegetables, it's not just from animals that you're going to get your parasitical activity. You can get it from your plants. You can get it from vegetables um, as well as the Giardia. It can come from vegetables as well. Yeah. So you pick watercress in the wild and you especially if it's in the water, you have a great chance of picking up a fluke. And these particular organisms um, actually get into the body as little cysts and they actually migrate up to the liver where they hatch and create uh, problems with your liver. So they're particularly nasty. You're going to see some um, elevation in liver enzymes a lot of times when there's a liver fluke present and especially when you see continual elevated um, liver enzymes and there's no hepatitis present and there's no cirrhosis present, there's no alcoholism present, you're going to start looking at those things and do a parasite cleanse. Yeah, and we don't have a picture of the mature one but we have the um, egg, the liver fluke egg there. Uh, which is what you pick up when you're um, eating the contaminated foods or water. All right, so now we've, we've met these nasty, unwanted tenants. How do we evict them? We want to evict the tenants, so <laughs> we want to do a parasite cleanse. So some of the potential benefits of the parasite cleanse include um, having increased energy levels, have me feeling more alert, having more clear thinking, having less stress, more flexibility in movement, improved hair, skin, and nails, uh, loss of body odor and bad breath, and weight loss can a lot of often occur with doing parasite cleanses. And those are after the parasite cleanse because during the parasite <laughs> cleanse, you're probably not going to feel any of those things. You're going to no, feel pretty gonna, icky. Yes. The parasite. So there are three parts to the parasite cleanse. Tell us about those three aspects to parasite cleanses. Um, and this is the way I apply it in my practice is when you're using the anti-parasitic remedies, um, where applicable, usually you'll start um, just in different areas of the body because the body can't handle total all at one time. You're going to cleanse the colon and the tissues to get rid of the dead parasites and toxins from the body as a first step and rebuild and rebalance the, the terrain so you don't get the reinfection going on. So step one is you're going to destroy them. You're okay. going to go in and break down um, the, the shell or the protein mechanism that makes up the the components of the parasite. So most of them are microscopic. And then some of them you know you'll have because you'll see them in the stool or the feces. Some will hang on to the intestines with those little teeth or that locking action like we talked about to try and survive because that's their mentality is survival. That's mm -hmm. all they know. And then as they die, they're going to be eliminated from the body. So, so let's do it look quickly at some of the, the formulas we have that can knock out those parasites. So first one is herbal pumpkin. The herbal pumpkin, um, the pumpkin seeds, the black walnut, the cascara, the violet um, leaves, chamomile, mullein, marshmallow, slippery elm are the components in that herbal pumpkin formula. And that does go in for the step one of this destroy. And it also um, is helpful for the prostate Just simply as well, because just pumpkin seeds are pumpkin rich in zinc. Because they're rich in zinc. And the next one is the Artemisia combination. And that has the elecampane, the inulin in it that we talked about, the mugwort, the clove flower buds, the garlic, ginger, spearmint, turmeric, olive leaf, and wormwood. And this is just, it's a general parasite cleansing formula. It's contraindicated for pregnant or nursing women, but this really gets the larvae. So it goes in and gets the egg portion of the parasite. This is the one that's cycle. really the strongest, you know, formula, the one that really knocks out the parasites. And then, of course, the yeast fungal detox. Well, yeast fungal detox because you want to work on where are they feeding? What's the offset, what they're feeding off from? And if they're feeding off from some of the residual off from the yeast of the abnormal yeast levels in the body, this um, particular formula has the caprylic, acium, uh, caprylic acid, the sodium propionate, the sorbic acid, echinacea purpurea, the oregano garlic, podiarco, selenium, and zinc. So it's a cleansing formula to help with abnormal candida levels. Um, for the die-off because you always have some candida in the body. It also helps um, 
again, to take away the buffet or the, the grazing ground for the parasites or the tenants that are going on. And it helps to strengthen the immune system that by enhancing the immune system, then the body goes back to its real simple mechanism of identifying self or not self so it can recognize that the parasites are there. Okay, and our last formula is gastro health, which I know you use for a lot more than just H. pylori. <laughs> um, I, I don't know that I've used it a lot for H. pylori. I use it for so many other things. So with the gastro health, again, I, I do it because of the inula in here, the elecampane, the capsicum, lecithin, lecithin because of its emulsification activity, and that's going to help break down some of the fats that the parasites are made out of, and it's going to change, again, the biological terrain. And or has the clothes. Too. The hosting, it has the cloves as well. It's going to change what they have to feed off from. Mm -hmm. and, and we have the, the prepackaged Paracleanse program, which contains a number of these formulas. It has the herbal pumpkin, the Artemisia combination, the yeast fungal detox, and of course the pawpaw cell reg, and it's conveniently packaged so you use it for 10 days. But then you want to take a break for one week and then do it again. And the reason for that is because you'll get rid of the parasites that are there, but there are eggs that may still be present and you give them a chance to hatch out and then knock them down again. And the program that I apply and that works really well is I'll do the Paracleanse pack for the 10 days. The seven days that they're taking a break, I have them do the Artemisia combination with um, the deep relief oil, which has the clove, nutmeg, and ginger in it, rubbed on the abdomen during that time frame, drinking water and lemon to alkalize the terrain so you can shift that. And then you'll do 10 days again on the parasite pack. Then you'll do seven days again on the Artemisia and do a third pack of the Paracleanse and finishing up the rest of the bottle of Artemisia at the end of that cleanse. And that tends to be a really good, like, um, just like twice a year protocol to go through for most people. Wow. Uh, I had a, a before the, the, the uh, Paracleanse came out, um, there was a kind of do-it-yourself cleanse that we did. and. Um, it's, this is a kind of cleanse mostly for worms that you use two herbal pumpkin three times a day, two black walnut three times a day, two artemisia combination three times a day, and two high potency protease three times a day, preferably between meals and one high potency garlic twice a day. And that's a program that you would want to follow for about um, two weeks, take a break for a week, and then repeat again for another two weeks. And when you're doing this, it's real important if your bowels aren't moving properly, you know, add a little fiber or a laxative to help get the, the toxins and keep the colon moving so that you can move the organisms out of your system as they're dying off. And I find it's like really important to increase your essential fatty acids like your omega-3, um, your flaxseed oil, because those help bind those toxins. So you don't get as much of a, a healing crisis from it that you feel like the um, nausea, the headaches, some of that. So if you can bind a lot of the expelled toxins with the fats, it'll help. Okay, good. And another um, program here is for Giardia. And this is actually, it takes about 20 grams of uh, uh, giardia, I mean a golden seal a day to work on giardia. So that's like four capsules five times a day. Um, you can add a little ginger to that because that helps um, calm the digestive tract down. And if you've got diarrhea with the giardia, you add charcoal, two activated charcoal two or three times a day and it's going to take about 10 days of doing that. Also you can do a um, yeast cleanse. Yeast is one form of a parasite with the yeast fungal detox, powdiarco, high potency garlic, uh, all cell detox, or you could use enviro detox and some fiber. This is to get the colon moving and to, to clean out the whole colon. And there's also some specific remedies that can also help with tapeworms in addition to what we've talked about. One is raw pineapple and fig juice using garlic in an enema, that's raw garlic, um, and the herbal pumpkin seeds, uh, actually the, the pumpkin seeds in like eating them to help knock out the worms. Now. You know, if you, you're going to get sick if you're just killing off parasites and you're not getting toxins out of your body. So the second part of this is to do the cleansing, right? That, the second part, it, it's really crucial to keep the colon moving. So um, I recommend when I'm doing that 30-day process with the seven between each of those, I recommend them having colonics done. But if you don't 
have a colon therapist in your area that you use, then um, you want to make sure that you're getting the fiber in, uh, maybe using the bowel detox, um, LBS2 if you have to, to keep everything flowing so you're not auto-intoxicating because the parasites are going to decompose and they're going to break down and that's going to create a toxic reaction too if it's not eliminated. So um, binding them with fiber, using an essential fatty acids, fatty acids for binding and keeping everything moving. And it, it, cleansing the colon also helps remove the environment so the parasites are not going to have a nice host environment. Um, it's also good to enhance the digestive system. Um, here are just some examples of some of the digestive aids, different enzyme formulas that you could use to help your digestion. These can also help break down the parasites. We also have in here some of the cleansing formulas that are available that you can use to help aid detoxification. Um, the cleansing formulas like um, the all cell detox, enviro detox, um, liver balance, and LBS2. And of course, um, we also have a list of some of the um, fiber products um, Psyllium Holes Combination, Everybody's Fiber, Nature's Three, and Loco. Now, you, you know, when you're trying to expel an unwanted tenant, sometimes it can get to be a pretty nasty process. So what are some of the things that you might want to watch out for? Um, uh, some of the problems that might occur while you're doing this uh, expulsion process. Well, some of the cleansing symptoms, it's like, you know, you pretty much expect to feel worse before you feel better. So you might have some possible nausea or flu-like symptoms going on. Um, you might have more of a diarrhea type action because the body is having to pick up its metabolic process to flush these out. So you might have um, headaches, um, gas and bloating and cramping and um, some pains in the joints and muscles. So again, it's going to feel kind of like you have the flu. Mm -hmm. And you can also have allergic reactions too, can't you? Some people will have allergic reactions, so you just back off and start cleansing slower when that happens because some people um, have um, like more of rash or breakout as the parasite secretions are starting to be eliminated. Um, you might even have a sinus type reaction that you start getting the congestion going on. So when you start having the allergy symptoms, just slow down on the cleansing a little bit. Don't, if you stop, of course, you have to start all over again. So when you start taking again, you're going to have the same reaction coming out. So just make sure you slow down a little bit and, and if, keep it going. And if you do have allergies, they might flare up during this time, right? A lot of times, um, one of the, the most common ones is the skin allergies flaring up with um, maybe like a little bout of eczema um, showing up. Um, again, the sinus stuff could, could show up. And... When the cleanse is initiated, the parasites may increase their secretions because what they're trying to do is, again, what they know how to do, survival. So once those secretions, and that's the toxic compound that's going to aggravate people the most, that's going to start flaring up, then you're going to want to do stuff to counteract that. So if that's coming up, again, you've got your fiber and you've got your essential fatty acids. So increase your fats um, in your foods, your good fats, and also increase your fat intake with your omega-3s, your flaxseed oil, and increase your fiber, just taking those at two separate times. And that's going to help bind a lot of those excretions and the toxins, and a lot of your mucilaginous herbs will help um, in that area as well. So some of the formulas that had the slippery elm in it would be really good to do at that time. And there was a note here you put about enzymes, that the body actually is producing enzymes to protect itself against parasites, and that may cause a problem when they're dying off. Right. Well, you have most of your enzyme production in this case comes from the white blood cells. So your white blood cell count can elevate when you're doing a parasite cleanse because of the enzymes that are produced from the white cells. So it, it produces those to detoxify the byproducts of the parasite. So it goes through a transition. So it's kind of like a type of withdrawal while it learns to start manufacturing these enzymes. So a, a lot of times your appetites and your cravings are going to be reduced because the body drops um, what it's doing food-wise and you almost get like, well, I'm not hungry and it's because the body's in that transition where it doesn't want to work on breaking down food because it's transitioning over here to start breaking down the excretions of the parasite. So it's just a, a shift in the metabolic process. Mm -hmm. Of course, the final step is to rebuild. I mean, a lot of people neglect this part because you've got to strengthen the colon and the, the tissues so that they're going to be resistant to, to not 
um, getting the parasites back again. The body is constantly removing old cells and rebuilding new ones, and when the body is toxic, it rebuilds new toxic cells rather than new healthy cells. So um, as you're going to rebuild, you're going to put good nutrition back into the body to help it build healthy cells that are now going to be more resistant to parasites. So nutrients, antioxidants, probiotics, and enzymes are essential to restoring balance, and you want to adjust your lifestyle by um, uh, getting rid of the sugar in the, while you're doing the parasite cleanse, even fruit, right? Anything that's going to spike insulin during the parasite cleanse because the parasites live off the glucose and the insulin. So that includes alcohol and that includes caffeine. And the alcohol, um, caffeine more so because it's constricting uh -huh. to the circulatory system. So it's constricting to the capillaries, so it gives you less of a mass surface area to eliminate toxins through. So you're not getting the capillaries delivering the offset of the excretions of the toxins to the lymphatic system as effectively as it should when you have constricted pathways due to the caffeine. Great. And of course, two good formulas for restoring tone to the intestinal tract after a cleanse like this would be the kudzu St. John's wort or the uno de gato combination. And it's always important after any kind of a cleanse like this to use probiotics. And um, we have a list here of some of the probiotic um, products, acidophilus, bifidophilus fluoroforce, probiotic 11, l -ruteri. And fermented foods like sauerkraut, kimchi, um, yogurt that's got live bacterial cultures. And these things can actually be taken when you're traveling to help protect your body from getting a parasitical infection. Because if you take these in high quantities, it actually protects your body against picking up the parasites. Wow, that was quite the, <laughs> the discussion. Well, you know, when you consider the fact that um, parasites can be involved in so many of the health problems that we see, um, facing people and, and being a part of the underlying cause, you can see why it's important that everybody should periodically do a parasite cleanse just to, um, you know, get rid of these things. I mean, obviously, a lot of people who live in tropical countries eat foods that um, actually help protect their body against parasites. So, for example, we had sushi last night, and the um, they serve pickled ginger and wasabi with the sushi, which are both anti-parasitic remedies to help you prevent you from getting parasites from the raw fish, um, eating papaya seeds. So where we don't do a lot of those things in this culture, a parasite cleanse at least probably once a year, um, especially if you travel a lot or have pets, it was very important to helping maintain your health. Thank you, Kim, for helping with this great information. And we hope that this will help you to uh, have better health and um, get rid of these little unwanted tenants that we have running around in our bodies.